Hello and welcome. My name is Rachel Pinotti. I'm the Director of Education and Research Services at the Levy Library here at Mount Sinai. It is my pleasure to welcome you this afternoon to the latest installation of the Levy Library Research Insider Series. It's not so black and white, race, health disparities, and how we report them. Before we begin today, a few brief housekeeping notes. We are a large group, so all participants are muted to minimize background noise. That said, we welcome your questions via the Q&A box, which should appear um, either at the bottom or possibly the right-hand side of your Zoom screen. Our student moderators will be collecting your questions and posing as many questions as possible to the panel at the Q&A discussion at the end of today's program. I'll also mention that the closed caption function is available in Zoom. So if you'd like to use that, that will also be available either at the bottom or the right-hand side of your Zoom screen. If you encounter any technical issues, please send us a message via the Q&A box and our AV team will try to assist you. As we get underway, I'd like to acknowledge and thank our Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai student collaborators, Paulos Mengstab and Kevin Weiss. Last fall, when Paulos and Kevin saw a troubling example of race being misused in an article in a prominent medical journal, rather than just shake their heads and move on, they decided they wanted to do something to draw attention to the issue. They contacted our Associate Dean of Library and Information Sciences, Dr. Gali Halevi, and their action turned into a partnership between themselves and the library that ultimately has resulted in the seminar you're attending today. Thank you, Paulos and Kevin, for getting the ball rolling on this event and for being fantastic partners throughout the planning process. You all will be hearing from Paulos and Kevin during the Q&A portion of the event. So, President Bill Clinton said on June 26, 2000, at the announcement of the completion of the Human Genome Project, I believe one of the great truths to emerge from this triumphant expedition inside the human genome is that in genetic terms, all human beings, regardless of race, are more than 99.9% .9 the same. And yet, as the sociologist and legal scholar Dorothy Roberts points out, more than 20 years later, biomedical research articles still commonly use race to describe research participants and populations, often without recognition or acknowledgement that race is a social, not a biological construct. In 2003, Saif Rathor and Harlan Krumholz wrote in the British Medical Journal, few would consider race to represent a unique biological factor that would modify the effect of any studied intervention. Instead, race and ethnic group are assumed to serve as proxies for a mix of genetic, disease, social, behavioral, or clinical characteristics, which vary by group. While some in the research community view the use of race as a proxy, as a concession to practicality, many argue that the use of race as a proxy is problematic precisely because it treats race as a biological reality rather than recognizing that it's a social construct. Indeed, as Rathor and Krumholz continue, relying on analyses stratified by race or ethnic group, rather than directly assessing the specific factor, which instead may be correlated with group membership, perpetuates pseudoscientific rationalizations of the fundamentally social concepts of race and ethnic group. Other scholars, including one of our esteemed speakers today, Dr. Perez Dable, point out that this risk needs to be weighed against the fact that in epidemiologic and clinical research, racial and ethnic categories are useful for generating and exploring hypotheses about environmental and genetic risk factors. And just last week, Dr. Luisa Borrell and colleagues wrote in the New England Journal, eliminating the use of race and ethnicity or implementing a racial ethnicity blind approach could enable inequitable healthcare systems to persist and exacerbate racial and ethnic inequalities in health outcomes. And this really brings us to the heart of the questions that we want to tackle today. It's worth noting that the importance of these questions goes beyond academia. The way that race is discussed in the journal literature spills over into popular media and shapes society's views. In today's seminar, we will be exploring these important issues and asking what roles funders, journals, and researchers play in the quest 
to explore race responsibly in research and tackle the often stark health disparities that exist in our country. We have a truly fantastic lineup of speakers to help us advance this conversation. I'm thrilled they've agreed to be with us here today and I'm excited to hear what they have to say. And with that, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Eliseo Perez Table. Dr. Perez Table is the director of the NIH's National Institute on Minority Health and Health Disparities, which seeks to advance the science of minority health and health disparities research through research, training, research capacity development, public education and information dissemination. Dr. Perez Table practiced general internal medicine for 37 years at the University of California, San Francisco, including serving as chief of the division of general internal medicine at UCSF for 17 years before moving to the NIH in September, 2015. His research interests include improving the health of racial and ethnic minorities and underserved communities, advancing patient-centered care, improving cross-cultural communication skills among clinicians, and promoting diversity in the biomedical research workforce. For more than 30 years, Dr. Perez Dable led research on Latino smoking cessation and tobacco control policy in the US and Latin America, addressing clinical and prevention issues in cancer screening and mentoring over 70 minority investigators. He's published over 250 peer reviewed articles and was elected to the National Academy of Medicine in 2001. Dr. Perez Table, thank you for being with us today and I will turn it over to you. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. Let me see if we can make the screen sharing work. And everybody see the slides? Yes. Okay, good. Um, so over the next 20 minutes, I'm going to give you uh, my perspectives on this issue. I think the framing was fantastic. And um, I'll be uh, maybe a little bit controversial. I definitely agree with the gist of the concerns raised, but I will uh, be a strong advocate for continuing to collect this information uh, and to use it because I believe it's a, it's a critical component uh, that influences health uh, and, uh, and what it represents exactly, we're not sure. So that's the summary, the one-liner. So I'll start with the NIMHD um, definition of what we call a population with health disparities. The first three bullets are in our legislation. Uh, so all minority groups as defined by the census, poor people of any color and underserved rural residents. In 2016, we declared sexual and gender minorities also as an NIH population with health disparities for research purposes. And an outcome that is worse in one of these groups compared to a reference group defines, in our, in our view, a health disparity. We also endorse the uh, concept that uh, all of these populations suffer from some level of social disadvantage that results in part from having been subject to discrimination or racism, uh, as well as having been underserved in healthcare. These are the census categories of race with some annotations from me. Um, this is the terminology used by the census. 2020 did not vary this. Uh, there are, it is consists of a two-part question where first you're asked, are you Latino, Hispanic, or Spanish origin, uh, to ascertain ethnicity, and then ask for race. The categories for race are African American or Black, Asian, which is very heterogeneous and includes people from South Asia, which is uh, problematic, um, but uh, that's what it, that's what it is. American Indian or Alaska Native, which is about 2% of the US population, Native Hawaiian or other Pacific Islander, who are about 1% of the US population, most often lumped in with Asian, which is wrong. And because this population not only is a different in every way we can look at, but also has a very different health profile compared to the majority uh, of East Asians for sure. Whites who include not people just from Europe, so the European American terminology is also wrong. Uh, it also includes people right now from the Middle East and North Africa and all the way into uh, what we call Western Asia. The uh, attempt by the census to change this for 2020 uh, was not approved by the administration. So there was a proposal to have MENA or Middle Eastern North African as a separate ethnic group 
and eliminate the two-part question, just ask, how do you identify yourself? And then the category of more than one race, which in 2010, 2.6% of Americans uh, endorsed that, even though we know that's far higher. We'll see what the 2020 results are. The one change that did get approved for 2020 was that all groups now, including whites and African-Americans, were prompted for a national uh, background uh, category. So wh where is your family from? People from Asia or Latin America uh, or uh, American Indians and in the uh, Native Hawaiian other Pacific Islanders had always been asked this, at least for the prior uh, two census uh, uh, years. And I would say uh, categorically that we believe that uh, race is, in, is a self-identified by definition. So that's the gold standard. There's no blood tests for race. And the definition is a social construct. Uh, and um, I keep repeating that to my colleagues at NIH. I think some of them now are beginning to believe me. So what does this all mean? Um, it's a, based on a geographic origin of uh, what racial classification was. Uh, genetic ancestry, the SNPs that uh, identify your geographic origin background, whether it's Africa, um, uh, Europe, uh, the Americas as the indigenous people, uh, Pacific Islands or, or East Asia are, is a tool and, and not a definition of race. Um, uh, the U.S. experienced for decades and for most of its existence a contrast of white and black. Uh, this was fairly straightforward. American Indians were marginalized. Um, and there was the one drop rule until not that long ago regarding definition of, of uh, blacks. American Indian and tribal members have used a one eighth uh, membership uh, to, to, for some tribes to be members. And people have also not uh, exactly uh, uh, politically correct talked about gradations of pigment in research. And ultimately there's also this mixed race and ethnicity which is what Latin America represents. Um, ethnicity referring to sort of self-identity with a group that you define in some way by racial admixture, geographic origin, culture, religion, and or language, but characteristically does not necessarily share phenotypic uh, characteristics. So uh, people from Latin America who are Latino, uh, as I prefer, or Hispanic, as is often used, uh, could be African origin, could be uh, Asian origin could be indigenous or could be European or any mix in between. Now, how does this compare to our um, ancestral markers? So in, a, in an interesting study done uh, in Northern California at Kaiser, published now several years ago, uh, over 100,000 participants were genotyped. Uh, they were asked to self-endorse um, from one of 23 racial ethnic categories that they created. And then they collapsed these into seven. I'll show you this in a minute. By self-report, 80, almost 84% were white and about 19% uh, were one of the racial ethnic minority groups. Interestingly, 90, almost 94% endorsed a single category, uh, not a mixed category. And then 6% endorsed both. And this is consistent with the 2010 census for the Bay Area. 12% um, were genetically admixed. These are the data on self-report on along the top here, the categories of uh, genetic ancestry are shown. And then over here is the self-report uh, racial ethnic category. So if, if you say you were white in this sample, 100% of participants uh, had European ancestry. Uh, similarly, if you said you're African-American, almost 100% had African ancestry. East Asia, the same thing. So this in a way verifies that self-report is pretty reflective of what we have called uh, you know, genetic ancestry in many ways. And Latinos uh, reflect the admixture that they are in Northern California, primarily from Europe uh, or white and, uh, and indigenous. Uh, so uh, I think this is evidence that this is a tool that we can use in discovery science uh, and, it's a, and it can be uh, evaluated for certain traits, but not a definition of ethnicity, of race ethnicity. So why do I say that race uh, and socioeconomic status are really fundamental factors in influencing health? They explain so much that we don't fully understand. They predict life expectancy and mortality, and not always in the direction that you think. For example, Latinos uh, live, have the longest life expectancy in the US for both men and women despite having adverse socioeconomic uh, status uh, compared to whites. African-Americans for the same exact level of blood pressure 
have more strokes uh, with the same blood pressure when compared to their white counterparts. And these are adults under 65 in an observational cohort study called the REGARD study, which is you know, the, the best science in terms of observational data. Poor people generally smoke and drink more and have higher body mass index and have higher rates of most chronic diseases, but it's not always the case and poor people can be healthy. Um, and among persons with diabetes in a large study from uh, Northern California, uh, all racial ethnic minority groups studied in that, in that uh, database have uh, with, with diabetes have less heart disease. They had fewer heart attacks compared to their white um, patients with uh, diabetes, but all had more end stage renal disease compared to white. So same disease, same health system, similar care, and yet 30% uh, less heart attacks in these groups and you know, double the rate of uh, end stage renal disease. How do we explain that? And I don't have the answer. I'm just saying these are ways that we need to understand. This is the, the gradient of socioeconomic status as measured by income in a household of four to um, a mortality ratio. Uh, so if, at $25,000 a year in a household of four, you're three times more likely to die than if you come from a household of $115,000 a year, which is well off, but certainly not wealthy. Um, and yet how many clinicians uh, know the socioeconomic status of their patients? Uh, many do, but they, we don't measure it in a routine way or in a standardized way. And we do equally poor job in most clinical research that's not focused on a social uh, perspective or a disparity perspective um, or a population science perspective. The importance of stratification and actually looking at how these interact is illustrated in part by this slide. These are data on suicide mortality from the CDC showing the differences by race, which again are unexplained. African-Americans and Latinos and Asians all have considerably lower rates of suicide compared to whites uh, and to American Indians, but split it off to rurality uh, so the rural areas and the rates go up, not just for whites, for uh, African-Americans, it didn't change. It went up slightly for Asians, up a lot for American Indians and up moderately for Latinos. So again, um, this is a, what, another reason why these things are important. All the social determinants of health are important. And we at uh, NAMHD have tried to emphasize this in our research. We've created a, a website uh, through the National Library of Medicine uh, in the Phoenix Toolkit um, website uh, on social determinants of health, where we vet the ones that everyone has already agreed that would be good to use. And we've actually been trying to vet these structural determinants of health, things of you know, access to housing, green space, broadband, uh, economic opportunity areas, transportation, schools, et cetera. Um, and, and we would really urge our uh, research community, our investigator community, uh, to try and, and measure these constructs with the same measures, since most of these are some sort of a metric that is derived from uh, secondary data or uh, administered questionnaire. Uh, it's not great to have uh, 20 different researchers measure thing, the same uh, construct 20 different ways. NIMHD has developed this, um, developed this uh, research framework uh, several years ago. Staff at our institute did this to really reflect a, a bit of a roadmap of what the research on minority health and health disparities can be that just capture not just the behavior and biology, but also the environment, both the physical environment and the social cultural environment and how we interact with the health, healthcare system across these different levels of influence. Mind you, most of our research portfolio is still in this individual column. Uh, we need to shift more of it to the interpersonal, to the community level, and then to policy or societal level research. Now, a colleague, I think you talked about Luisa Borrell's uh, paper uh, there's in the New England Journal recently, and a couple of the authors of that also authored on this pattern script. I wasn't part of this at all. Um, this was an evaluation of epigenetic variation among diverse Latinos and trying to, to evaluate, to weigh what the contribution of the genetic ancestry generated by this uh, distribution of humans at the, the origin in East Africa uh, around the globe versus a self-identified race ethnicity. So what might this represent compared to your genetic programming 
in terms of epigenetic uh, variation in methylation levels. And what um, uh, Josh Galanter concluded here was that about a quarter was associated with race ethnicity exclusively with some overlap with associated with genetic ancestry at 62%. So my, my point is that these constructs explain outcomes that we don't fully understand, uh, that they are extremely useful in understanding uh, science and pathways, uh, especially in the context of the available uh, in, in information on biology. And as we uh, expand our, our biological knowledge, um, not just you know, the genetics and the epigenome, uh, but the microbiome and, and the brain initiative, all these things are contributing to our knowledge. Uh, it is going to be important to look at it through the lens, not just of age and gender, but also uh, self-identified race, ethnicity, and uh, socioeconomic status. Um, you heard I'm a former primary care clinician, so I have a strong uh, link to primary care internal uh, as, a, as a model of service. Um, we, we know this is a powerful tool to influence behavior and to influence patient outcomes. Um, we also know that when patients have trouble often understanding their doctor, uh, they don't really, doctor doesn't listen to me, I have questions I didn't have a time to ask. And we know that we can enhance communication with patients, uh, make it more precise, more precision in patient-clinician interactions. One of these ways to do that is uh, through race, ethnic concordance of patients and doctors, which of course is challenging because there's not as many minority doctors, uh, but also knowing about your patient, knowing where they come from, their race, ethnicity, their social class, I, I would say are essential in clinical care. And to pretend that uh, all of our clinical care is gonna be blinded to race, we're just gonna be completely objective, uh, is in my view, uh, a risk for doing harm uh, if you do that. Um, at the same time that we acknowledge that there is a history of discrimination and racism. So let me uh, delve into that for a couple of minutes. So um, 2015 survey from Kaiser Family Foundation showed that at the past month, the past 30 days, 53% of African-Americans said that they had been treated unfairly because of race, ethnic background, in store work, entertainment, dealing with police, or getting health care. 53% in the last month. So racism is very much alive in our country and happens every day. 36% of Latinos endorse the same statement, and we do a lot better in health care, but still uh, is present. So I, I think this is one of the other reasons why it's so important uh, to measure and understand what race ethnicity means. In racism as a research construct, most of it has been done on the interpersonal uh, area. So you ask someone, have you experienced uh, discrimination or racism? And then you measure it. There are very good scales. They're on the Phoenix website. Um, uh, and these have been uh, lots of data, lots of research showing this. Other areas of racism here are less well studied, particularly internalized. Perceived societal discrimination is asking people, well, what do you think is going on out there? And this has been used with adolescents. And then secondhand effects is, what if uh, someone in a household is a victim of racism? What does that do to their loved ones or their, their, co their uh, coworkers or their children? Um, the uh, impact of racial inequity harming health through racism as the mechanism, uh, I think can best be conceptualized as a form of cumulative chronic stress. So, so um, fitting in with the adverse childhood events model. So you're exposed to chronic stress from constant, uh, perhaps microaggressions, different forms of, of racism over time, and that has an effect on your health. Uh, most of the research, as I said, has been done with these um, interpersonal racism and the effects on physical and mental health status. Uh, on physiological measures related to cardiovascular reactivity or inflammatory markers, things like allostatic load, and then discrimination, uh, how it impacts health behaviors, uh, smoking, problem drinking, and substance use have been well studied. But data linking it to other disease outcomes are less robust, and so this is a call for uh, research in these areas. However, the area of structural racism needs our attention today. Um, given the events of the past year, I think this has become much more conscious of this history, culture, institutions, and policies that codified practices that really perpetuate inequity by promoting an ideology of inferiority. And it exists 
not only out there in society, but also in our institutions, including NIH um, and Mount Sinai, um, our academic institutions, uh, as an organized system that categorizes, ranks, devalues, and disempowers and allocates resources accordingly. Sometimes it's done by controlling who gets uh, membership, who gets admitted, uh, who gets a grant, um, or who gets uh, their paper accepted, uh, as one, or who gets a promotion. Um, residential segregation is probably the cornerstone of this policy in the last 50 years uh, and where most of the research has been done. NMHC has now embarked on a, on a process to evaluate this more, not uh, the structural racism construct for research purposes. Uh, we did a workshop several years ago. We had it uh, spelled out in our visioning um, uh, uh, statements and that are in American Journal of Public Health from a couple of years ago. A couple of quick examples. Uh, this is a study from New York City. So low black serving hospitals, notice that African-American women in this column here had a lower rate of severe maternal morbidity uh, compared to white women at going to have give birth at a high black serving hospital. This is structural. This is not, oh, the black women are less healthy, therefore they do worse. Oh, the white women take do better health behavior or they got better health care. Uh, maybe health care is part of it. But there's a problem when the hospitals have this level of difference when you stratify by race. Let me finish with a comment about COVID since that's all I do nowadays almost. Um, uh, last year, we, uh, with Monica Webb Hooper and Anna Annapolis, uh, the two scientific leaders at our institute, uh, we published a perspective in JAMA on the, uh, what we were seeing happening at that time with early data. Um, nothing has changed. Today, over 50% of cases and almost 50% of mortality is occurring in Latinos, American Indians, Alaska Natives, and African Americans. We represent about a third of the population. So there's a huge disparity. And this pandemic has just shown a light on this structural uh, racism issues in this country. This disproportionate burden um, really is not because of higher comorbidity. Uh, that maybe accounts for more severity and more mortality, especially early on when we weren't sure uh, how to manage these, these, uh, these cases, these patients. It's really social and structural related to a uh, higher proportion of public facing jobs, crowding in housing, uh, multi-generational home uh, uh, living in the same household, just more close quarters and, and more crowded communities. This is the driving force behind this. And understanding and implementing and developing and understanding factors and implementing uh, prevention and uh, strategies to prevent this um, are a priority for NIH. This is just an example of the data from CDC from last June when we thought we were peaking at uh, 70,000 cases a, a day. We're, now we've more than tripled that since. Uh, and in these 89 counties, uh, 79 counties, sorry, the CDC looked down and, and compared to the demographic representation of the population, you can see that for Latinos, it was over four times, for Blacks, 2.3 times, et cetera. Uh, with a, a fair number of counties for uh, at least three of the uh, five minority groups. I'm gonna pause, I'm gonna stop there. Uh, just refer you to our um, strategies perspectives uh, in the supplement of AJPH from a couple of years ago and our contact information. Thank you very much for your attention. And stop sharing. There we go, okay. Thank you so much for your um, presentation and your remarks. I mean, you really laid out quite clearly um, just how stark some of these issues are. And um, I'd love to now um, turn to our, our next speaker and introduce our next speaker, Dr. Sri Devi Narasimhan, who has trained in microbiology, molecular genetics, and metabolism at the National University of Singapore, UMass Medical School, and Harvard Medical School before joining Cell in 2012, where she currently serves as deputy editor. In this role, she's involved in journal strategy, content and team management, as well as leading the team's diversity and inclusion efforts. Dr. Narasimhan also heads cross-cultural, excuse me, cross-journal communication and collaboration efforts at Cell Press Journals. She handles papers across the journal's topic scope and serves as the strategy lead for Cell's microbiology, immunology, and metabolism content. 
She enjoys interacting with the broader research community, especially early career researchers, postdocs, and students, and believes it's never too early to talk about science or ideas. Dr. Narasimhan, a warm welcome to you, and thank you for joining us today. Thank you very much. Thank you for the kind invitation uh, to the Levi Library and the organizers, and uh, I'm extremely honored to be speaking beside uh, such esteemed uh, fellow panelists. So thank you very much. Uh, I'll get my screen shared. Right. And full screen shared, all good? Yes. Great, thank you. Well, I'm going to be taking a step back from uh, the core questions of today's discussion. I will touch upon them uh, through some of our um, initiatives and slides, but my presentation is more of a big picture, focusing on where um, we as editors, uh, journals, publishing, where we do, where, we, where, where do we fit in and where can we play a role? Uh, within the broader theme of and broader topic of inclusion and diversity. So today I am speaking as an ambassador on behalf of my journal and on behalf of Cell Press. Um, but uh, I will, I will, you know, definitely touch upon um, a number of different in initiatives that are ongoing and things that we're thinking about in the future. Um, and before I kick it off, you know, where we're coming from essentially is that science is an exciting endeavor. That's, that's, that's what rocks our world. Um, communicating science, working with scientists, figuring, figuring out what the next big thing is. But science is uh, linked um, to society, you know, all of the issues that plague the world that we live around, disparities, issues, differences, hierarchies, um, discrimination, those are part and parcel of science. And we, uh, as editors consider ourselves very much part of the of the scientific community and hence feel that we have a role and responsibility in this space too, to be able to addressing some of these issues and that our role is not limited to publishing the actual papers itself, but it's much, much beyond that, as I hope um, to uh, share with you in the next few slides. So for the purpose of this, this discussion and today's theme, um, our role um, is to listen and learn first and foremost, uh, to understand, educate ourselves on different experiences and perspectives, uh, thereby acknowledge gaps and perspectives and gaps and problems and perspectives that are uh, obvious, but also not obvious to us where we have much, much more to learn. Uh, and, and then based on that, act on the information we receive, act on ways that we within our view or else through our connections and through being part of this community and almost being part of this pipeline at the end of dissemination of a science, still being part of this, act on this and to improve representation, establish opportunities, platforms, and uh, to educate, support, empower, and, and fulfill some of the commitments that we make. So this started with uh, last year with an editorial that we wrote, which really was um, uh, looking within and, and realizing that uh, there is, you know, science has a racism problem and that we are as much part of it. Historically, science has had multiple examples of uh, racism, you know, rearing its ugly head and that this, this continues. And we pledged to um, listen, educate and try and act on certain, certain uh, next steps. But again, we, we realize that we need to partner with, we need to work with the community to really identify what are tangible next steps. So uh, why journals, why editors, what do we bring? I mean, first and foremost, I think it's visibility. It's a platform that multiple people are engaged in, 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 in absorbing information, in sharing information. And um, the, the visibility of a topic or of uh, a person being uh, you know, featured or their voice being heard uh, on, on the pages of the journal can, can really uh, reach a larger audience. Uh, and as I said earlier, our role is not limited to just publishing the science. I mean, that is obviously a big part of what we do, but it's also that the pages of Cell or the journals at Cell Press are a platform for discussion and dialogue. Um, and hopefully also towards uh, discussing steps towards addressing or resolving issues. Um, 
we have a strong commitment within the journal. You know, sometimes I will speak on behalf of Cell, sometimes Cell Press. Um, but you know, we have we have we've had we have a strong commitment to improving diversity in science. We've been thinking about this at many many different levels, from peer review, right, the recognition that um, science itself is a very diverse endeavor. I love reading. Um, my, my, actually, my favorite part about reading a paper is looking at the big author list, right? And you start like scroll, scrolling and hovering over affiliations and you realize that they come from all over the world and they come from all sorts of different stages who contribute uh, to um, a paper, right? It, it's it's from, the, from the technician to the postdoc to the PI to the core specialist. Um, and and this, this diversity has not really evolved in a way when you think about the peer review of science that seems to be far more siloed and in the hands of a few. So how do you diversify a science in that way uh, in terms of authority to front matter content or in terms of conference speakers, how diversified are our speaker lists or are we just, you know, looking at the same few names again and again who rightfully in their place have, you know, a certain name and recognition, but where's everybody else? How do you how do you make sure that there is uh, equitable representation and um, visibility in science? Um, and as I said earlier, what what where we come from and why we feel we have something to offer is a sense of community that we are a part of this endeavor as much as uh, everybody else. And especially if there are situations and there are processes by which by which we are contributing to these disparities, to racism, these, to these problems, we, we absolutely should own up and see what we can do. So we do have a uh, diversity pledge and you know, this, this uh, initially was kicked off with um, looking at disparities in gender, but we, we do recognize that there are um, under there is underrepresentation across the research, research enterprise at many levels. And our commitment across CELPRES is to elevate people of these under underrepresented groups, be it geography, be it ethnicity, be it gender, uh, and uh, you know, really, as I said, partner with the community to see how, what, what, what can we do, and what can we do together. So I, I, I want to take a step back and talk about um, just how we kickstarted some of these a few years ago, looking at gender and and how it gets far more complicated once we start talking about race. Um, with with gender, uh, it was. A clear, you know, clear disparity in terms of, you know, the the uh, female reviewers we had Very, far fewer female reviewers than male reviewers and um, advisory boards in the authors who are commissioned or you know who we invited to write for us. There were huge disparities, and we said, all right, we need to just start act on getting better because there are plenty of qualified women, um, and. And, and hence, you know, we've 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 done a couple of things in terms of very proactively improve uh, the diver gender diversity of our editorial boards uh, across journals. Um, we we established a self identification op option in our online uh, editorial uh, system. It's called Editorial Manager, where you have the option to identify your gender, male, female, non-binary, or prefer not to say. If this is not something you wish to disclose, totally fine. But we've been collecting this with the hope of tracking our own progress in in um, in, in peer review, for example, or in terms of uh, authors or corresponding authors, trying to see in terms of female authors who have submitted to us versus male authors, uh, how are we faring with uh, publication, with rebuttals, uh, you know, our own internal biases. So, so there are these different options that we that we are aiming to explore with these, um, and and also just the option with non-binary um, as well, because often as you think about any kind of uh, gender distribution, it's often seen in a very binary lens. So, those are some of the some of the some of the progress that we started thinking about for gender, um, you know, conference invitations, whatnot. And along the same lines, um, we had been thinking, all right, what about other forms? How can we how can we uh, look at some of those other differences and other disparities. And when it starts coming to um, geography, I think that's something we can start talking about. There are tools to try and track where is the author submitting from um, and you know where are the different authors coming from around the world. But once you start talking about race and ethnicity, it is more challenging to define. We have heard now at least twice, right, that this is a social construct. Um, it's also, to me, very, um, interesting and intriguing. I am Indian, so, and Indian, Indian, um, and, you know, I for, I spent my undergraduate years in Singapore, and there they would have a race question for anything that you could ask. Any sort of form that you're filling, there would be a race question, and my race there was Indian. 
And it was obvious to me, it's like Indian is not a race. And when I'm here, I'm Asian. And we've talked about what, what, what do these different groups really mean and how does one identify and why do you need this information? But on the other hand, you realize that when there are disparities in science, when there is underrepresentation from different groups, you want to be able to capture that in some way. Uh, and, and then how do you about, go about doing this? And how comfortable would someone be if we did have this kind of self-identification tool required for um, you know, manuscript submissions and there with author information be, be, besides geography, besides gender, if you have this question, is, is it going to be race? Is it going to be ethnicity? How do you how do, you do this? Um, also racial categories, as I said earlier, in one country, uh, United States, you know, do they apply elsewhere? What, are, what is the breakdown elsewhere? Um, so it's not as straightforward. And yet we realize that there are differences and there are disparities. And this recognition of disparities is, is um, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's within cell as well. You know, we've realized that uh, across cell press, you know, we have probably less than 10 um, um, staff. This includes editorial, non-editorial, uh, you know, all sorts of division, probably less than 10 individuals. When you look at other uh, groups, uh, you know, Latinx or uh, Native Indian and, and other underrepresented minority, very, very few. Um, there's been no black editor at Cell ever historically until now. We only have two black editors um, uh, across Cell Press. So um, what are we doing really in terms of our, you know, representation within our own group, within our own community? You know, when we, even if you want to start looking beyond, you have to look within first. Um, so what are some of the things that we've started doing? And I'm going to touch upon many, many different things here. So apologies for that. But I do hope that through the course of these next few slides, I'll be able to get at some of those questions about um, information relating to race or ethnicity, at least in, in science, or collecting that in the, in the form of the authorship and, and so on and so forth. So since um, last year, I would say, that's when most of this has kicked off. What have we been doing? I think the very first step is listening and learning. We realize that, all right, we've got, we've got a platform, we've got, we've got a readership, we've got an audience, and we've got the ability to disseminate information. Let's listen and let's help others listen. Uh, and, and it's been really trying to reach out to um, some people we know and people we don't know. And, and asking them to share with us, you know, their experiences, their voices, and their perspectives. So we have had um, editorials, we've had voices from people, um, focus on, on Black scientists, but then uh, also extending beyond. And from there, uh, we, we pledge to say, all right, let's, let's, at least, let's try our best to amplify and highlight the voices of um, underrepresented uh, uh, scientists from underrepresented groups uh, at Cell. So we launched something called Faces of Cell, which is basically if you are an author on a cell paper, um, any level, and if you identify as uh, one, you know, as uh, underrepresented minority belonging to one of these groups, so Black, Indigenous, Latinx, LB, LGBTQ, or other disadvantaged scientists such as refugees, homeless, you know, we will feature you. We will, we would like to share your story, and we've we've had multiple such profiles. Um, and, and this does get challenging, right? Because we do get, we do get um, um, requests from um, scientists around the world from other groups, you know, a, a, a majority in one country is a minority in other, right? So there are some of these cases where we're like, all right, how do we, how do we hold true to the purpose of this? And we don't want to discourage, are there other ways we can find to also make sure that, you know, it is more inclusive, that we have other opportunities as well, but, but these have come up. And, We've also concomitantly, besides listening, learning, you know, try to amplify topics and, and voices of need. You know, this could be uh, issues with uh, the pipeline, uh, the STEM pipeline. It could be, all right, I want to invite more um, um, Black or Latinx uh, reviewers, or I want to go about inviting more conference um, speakers or webinar speakers. How am I going to find these names? All right, working, you know, very proactive members of the community working with us to identify names and, and curate these names and sharing these names. So, so not having an access to qualified scientists is an excuse. That, that's not an excuse. It shouldn't be an excuse. And it should allow us to also diversify and populate our databases for, you know, qualified people that we can reach out to, as well as qualified uh, scientists that we can reach out to uh, who, whose work, you know, hopefully we can also publish in our journals down the road. Um, with with, um, with 
uh, funding with uh, issues of uh, mentorship and disparities. I mean, just just bringing bringing a platform for all of these different topics together on the pages of Cell are something that you know we we started doing in across Cell Press. Um, also, with um, you know the pandemic, uh, as was alluded to earlier, uh, it's 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 it was hard not to cover this, right? The glaring disparities and health glaring disparities in across um, um, morbidity, across case counts, and um, trying to really address these issues upfront while we were publishing COVID-related science and uh, progress. It was also important side by side to look at sort of this human element, the social element of this, um, and trying to feature as best as we can a, a range, a, across different topic areas, across different fields, uh, names and scientists. Um, and I just want to give a shout out here. The guy you see holding the microphone is the editor in chief of Cell, John Pham. So he is, um, he's uh, prior to all of these efforts also, he's been very active with um, the L LGBTQ community, but you know, it's, it's something that we've been thinking about, but bringing it into action has really gained a lot of momentum. Thanks in support to uh, very active members of um, different communities that have been involved in mentorship, who have been thinking about this for a while and who also have been looking for a platform beyond their groups, beyond their departments, beyond their divisions to, to, to really try and um, share their experiences or share their network and say, hey guys, these are some of the things we're doing. This is something you can adopt in your own system. So even bridging that kind of connect um, has 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 been something that at least we've been managed to be able to do with some of these articles. One good example is is this commentary that came out not too long ago now, um, two weeks ago, which was fun black scientists, which really was came to us from um, um, these uh, you know representatives of these uh, biomedical engineering faculty who reached out to us and said. We'd, we'd like a phone call. And it was a tough phone call. It was a wake up phone call. And one where, uh, you know, they said, look, there are studies, studies that say there's disparities. And then it ends there. We know there are disparities. Action needs to happen right now. We want to be able to communicate this. You guys are part of this problem. What you publish, what you choose to publish, the different areas let's find a path together. And it was working with them, their voice, of course, our just little editorial tweets, but their voice and having this platform and, and really very visually trying to show like, do you want to know what disparity looks like? This is what the disparity looks like. These are the steps that the community needs to work with us together in, in really addressing and looking very much at the NIH. And uh, since then, you know, we've been interested in, in trying to see also all right, we can we can put these articles out. Can we also get stakeholders, funders, uh, decision makers uh, also on board? Can we also bring them here and you know uh, engage them in a discussion? It it doesn't need to be in the pages of Cell, but if it can be on the pages of Cell, that would be wonderful as well because then you can actually feel like you're contributing to a process rather than piecemeal coverage of. A whole load of different topics and then letting go of that in time of which this is an example this is where um, Lola and Kelly and everybody came from saying that there's enough of these articles we need to get this moving in action so in terms of you know so so all of that was the kinds of articles and the kinds of um, you know front matter content that that we, we started um, we started uh, publishing and uh, you know, amplifying voices, but along the same lines, we thought, all right, what, what else can we do to collect this information, right? And uh, recently we implemented a diversity and inclusion form. So this is very much like, you can think of it as a declaration of interests form. Uh, when people are writing out their methods, they were like, all right, here's the, you know, do you have data code availability statement? So it, it goes with the paper. It's optional, but what it does is it, gives um, authors enough of flexibility to factor in how they were more, they, they factored in inclusion and diversity in their study. Now it could be in the form of um, just the content, right? Cell lines you, you used, or if it was genetics, genomics data, was it representative of, um, you know, a broader 
um, broader ethnic group, more geographically diverse, what kind of cell lines, gender is something that we've been asking for, like, because we know of, obviously, of the differences across um, um, biological sex in terms of responses to drugs and whatnot. It is, it, th there are these differences, and yet often when cell lines or mice or whatnot, you relegate those studies only to one gender, you're not really, you can't really extrapolate beyond that. So it's really a platform to try and spell out that when you factored in your study, were you more inclusive? Were you thinking of those different variables and different parameters and different groups that you could have? So that's the scientific content, but it, it we also wanted to provide um, others with an opportunity to include other information. So be it, um, you know, and, and these are not names. This is, you know, we, we're keeping it more at the level of the group and, uh, you know, identifying as part of, a, of an underrepresented minority group funding from such a group, or we were thinking about how are you thinking about diversity or inclusion in uh, the study itself, if not the science. And we got some, feedback on this, obviously some concern, how are you going to use this? Am I going to be penalized? No, ultimately for us, it's always about the science. It's about whether the science is interesting or not. It's not about who the authors are. It's not about what the breakdown of the authors are. But at the end of the day, if this is something that can spur some thinking, if it can, it can raise some sort of awareness at the end of the day that, you know, you have to factor the, you have to think about all of these elements right from the very science that you do and the very samples that you're sampling and what it means really at the end of the day for is this really truly representative of um, um, how things will pan out either scientifically or whether it is truly inclusive or representative of the diverse enterprise that science is. I, we want them to start thinking about this. Um, and, and hopefully as we gather more data, again, only as aggregate, not specific names, not specific details, we'll have more to report. So it's very new, but, um, but Overall, we've had very positive feedback on this. And I think the most obvious place where journals can improve their overall uh, you know, um, output here is really the publication of science itself, right? So what kind of science do you publish? And how do you make sure that, that those are themselves helping with diversifying uh, just, you know, databases, the repertoire of gen genetic information of, um, of just even clinical samples out there. So be it, you know, diversifying the, the, the genetics um, uh, to make sure that you've got uh, populations around the world uh, represented because as was alluded to earlier, you know, there are genetic differences, there are ethnic differences that can drive differences in uh, metabolism, in response to disease, in disease variants, in drug responses, whatnot. Um, and, and the field of genetics recognizes this a fair bit, but we also find uh, a responsibility in also um, publishing work that traces historically, right, the genetic history of populations, where do they come from? Uh, some parts of the world are better studied than the others, but we think it's equally responsible to have an open mind with, you know, understanding the genetic history to understand modern day populations and how that may inform, um, you know, the actual distribution and representation. Now, some of these papers can often be more controversial, um, you know, and a very good example is this uh, paper we published about an ancient Harappan genome and how, you know, right-wing nationalist governments try to tweak that and tweak the message of what it really means to be Indian. You know, of course, we have no control over what people do downstream, but what we do is we have a responsibility to publish good, solid science as is and representative of populations around the world, right? Or it could be about, um, uh, the microbiome was mentioned earlier about how changes with westernization or, you know, you make genetics, ancestry, ethnicity, and then you start living in a different part of the world, how social or um, societal, I mean, so how social, societal, uh, diet, all of those lifestyle elements can influence, influence health and physiology. So those are all at the intersections of science that we are very interested in, that we are very, very much care about at Cell and Cell Press, and we will continue to publish those. Besides those, a couple of other things quickly that I'd like to talk, talk, upon, uh, talk about was um, we, we have also thought about partnerships and partnering with communities in terms of supporting scientists. So a recent such example is the Rising Black Scientists Awards, which is uh, with cell signaling a partnership to try and 
publish essays from um, scientists and their, their essays will be published itself. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's it's to really share those stories and perspectives, but also, as I said, at the end, you know, at the start of the conversation, to give visibility to these, uh, to uh, really capable, qualified young scientists. And, um, but beyond this, you know, we've been thinking about uh, in this year, um, I think one of the advantages of being um, virtual is that, you know, you you actually don't have so much of a travel budget anymore, which often used to limit us. Um, but now, you know, thinking about we we do a lot of editorial outreach and talks, but those are often at institutions that, um, um, you know, we we are looking at a lot of names and scientists that that we know. So, you know, if I can do an editorial outreach and talk at Harvard Medical School or Rockefeller, um, I could I could and I should do it at other institutions across the country and around the world. And we are thinking of also including historically black colleges or undergraduate institutions or or just places where we could connect, engage. Um, and inspire hopefully people to think about science and think about communicating science ahead of time. Uh, and internship opportunities at Cell Press to have, um, you know, either from science communication or editorial early on, giving people a feel of what this is about, what a career here looks like, or what does it mean to actually think about disseminating scientific information at a time when there is so much misinformation. Um, training opportunities for uh, scientists across uh, the country and world about science communication or how to peer review a paper. Uh, and as I said, conference webinars lined up, who we ask to write. There are all of these, I feel like easy wins that from our side, we can actively start doing where at least we have more engagement and more connection with the community and it doesn't feel so removed. Or, um, you know, if I may say like this elitist tag that that seems to be um, associated that that no, we want to be approachable, we want to be reachable. So there's a lot more going on, you know, I feel like I've covered a lot of ground. And, um, but this, the inclusion and diversity statement again is new. We are pa partnering with academic research centers. We have active talks, for example, with the BU Center for Anti-Racist Research uh, to help frame thinking, to frame um, practice, uh, hopefully more such academic partnerships at other institutions. Uh, the pandemic has told us how important it is to accurately communicate science over a barrage of information and over the top, um, you know, uh, misinformation but also over the top uh, almost alarmist information so how how do we keep things accurate how do you keep things factual and how do you keep the momentum going we are uh, in the process of almost hiring a diversity uh, an inclusion and diversity officer at cell press who will be uh, making sure that the journals and uh, the company are on top of our goals and helping to set goals um, and um, most importantly, with all these efforts, uh, what we're most constantly thinking about, how do we measure the effects, benefits, or impact of these endeavors? And how, how could we be doing these better? So along with any such effort that we put in, you know, the effort is like, all right, how do you measure it? How do you know if this is impactful? How do you know what is worth your while? How could we, making, we be making a better impact? So all of those measurement aspects are also um, tied in with these efforts, uh, but because this is, newer and because we are going in all of these directions what we really would like to do is continue to hear from you from the community uh feedback ideas guidance um and there are lots of different ways to contact us and i hope you will thank you so much for your talk that was so interesting i think it's interesting that both of our speakers so far have highlighted the importance of um you know, sort of not just looking beyond their organizations, but looking within their organizations. Um, before we move on to our next presentation, I do want to um, just remind everybody that we'll be doing um, some Q&A at the end and invite everybody to submit their questions via the Q&A feature. Um, and now I'd like to introduce Rear Admiral Chardet Arojo, who serves as the Associate Commissioner for Minority Health and the Director of the Office of Minority Health and Health Equity at the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. In this role, Rear Admiral Arojo provides leadership oversight direction and direction on minority health and health disparity matters for the agency. 
Rear Admiral Orojo previously served as the Director of the Office of Medical Poly Policy Initiatives in the FDA's Center for Drug Evaluation and Research, where she led a variety of broad-based medical and clinical policy initiatives to improve the science and efficiency of clinical trials and enhance both professional and patient labeling. Real Admiral Arojo joined the FDA in 2003, where she held several positions in the Center for Drug Evaluation and Research. She received her Doctor of Pharmacy degree from Virginia Commonwealth University, completed a pharmacy practice residency at the University of Maryland, and earned a master's degree in pharmacy regulation and policy from the University of Florida. Rear Admiral, thanks so much for being here today, and I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Rachel. It's a pleasure to be here with everyone today and share information from an FDA perspective, a regulatory agency, so shifting gears yet again. And I am going to just take a moment to share my screen. Okay, everyone see that? Yes. Okay, great, thank you, Rachel. Um, so again, good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here with all of you today. And as I mentioned, I'm gonna shift gears a little bit more and talk about um, the work that we are doing from a FDA perspective and particularly from an Office of Minority Health and Health Equity perspective. And also talk a little bit more about how we are collecting data and how we are trying to report and share that data, especially um, race and ethnicity data that we advocate and really um, work to advance and make sure that we are highlighting and sharing that data and um, also specifically linking that to our clinical trial diversity efforts and the work that we're doing across the agency. Um, many of you are probably familiar with the FDA. We are responsible for protecting public health by assuring the safety, efficacy, and security of the range of products that we regulate, and we regulate many um, from both drugs, biologics, medical devices, and a range of other products. And in 2010, the FDA established the Office of Minority Health. We were renamed in 2019 to the Office of Minority Health and Health Equity. And we work to protect and promote the health of racial and ethnic minority and other underrepresented populations by focusing our work on research and outreach and communication that works towards addressing health disparities. And to provide a little bit of background about our office, um, I think it's also helpful to understand, you know, the work that we do across the agency. And we are an office of seven staff. So we are a small office. We sit within the office of the commissioner. We work broadly across our agency, as well as, of course, work with both public and private sector stakeholders. The one thing to also highlight, too, when you're thinking about this from the perspective of a regulatory agency, you know, we're not conducting the trial, we're reviewing the data that is submitted to us. So across our FDA product centers and offices, um, the review divisions within those centers are reviewing the data that is submitted. And our particular office is not a part of that review process, but we are there, as, of course, as a resource for our centers and offices. Our particular focus um, is conducted throughout our two programmatic areas, our research and collaboration program that aims to advance minority health and health equity focused research from supporting both intramural as well as extramural research, um, participating in research opportunities across our agency where we are really advocating for data and projects and research that helps us to advance our minority health and health equity focused agenda. Um, one of those, for example, is participating in our Centers of Excellence in Regulatory Science and Innovation. These are collaborations between FDA and certain academic institutions. We, of course, support internships and fellowships and really broadly engage with our stakeholders to advance our research agenda. Um, our outreach and communication program, we aim to improve FDA's communications with the populations that we serve. And we do this through a variety of different programs, initiatives, and campaigns that are all culturally and linguistically competent. One of those is our diversity and clinical trials initiative. I'm gonna talk a little bit about that program and a lot of the data and the reporting that the agency has with regards to some of the demographic information from the clinical trials that support FDA approval for certain medical products. Um, we also have a language access program where we aim to provide flexible means for our centers and offices to acquire language access services. We develop health education materials, engage in social media outreach, and a lot of other activities that we have across our outreach and communication program. But the one thing that I will highlight 
especially, of course, working in the space of health disparities across all of the work that we do, we are really working to make sure that we can foster collaborations and partnerships because we know that we cannot do that work alone. Um, so before I get into kind of highlighting the data that I'm going to share from one of the programs that the agency has, I wanted to kind of set the stage for the terminology that you're going to hear. And Eliseo talked about this a little bit earlier. Um, for FDA, being that we are a regulatory agency, we follow the Office of Management and Budget categories for race ethnicity. So from the perspective of the data that is collected and co that comes into our agency, these are the minimum categories of, of what um, how that data may be captured. And um, LSAO kind of talked about some of these earlier, so I won't go into more detail related to this, but I did just want to set the stage for, for the categories and um, how that information, and you'll hear me speak into these in just a moment. Um, the other thing I wanted to highlight, again, of course, we um, regulatory agency, we have specific guiding regulations. So it also impacts the data that comes into our agency. So I wanted to highlight our 1998 demographic rule where our investigational new drug regulations require that IND data regarding subjects participation in clinical trials be presented in annual reports by gender, age, and race. Um, with our NDA regulations or new drug applications, we require that sponsors of NDAs include summaries of effectiveness and safety data presented by gender, age, and race. So as that data comes in, of course, from the very beginning, um, we have information reported to us specific to race and ethnicity. Um, I also wanted to highlight another legislation that has definitely um, guided work across both the Office of Minority Health and Health Equity and other offices across the agency, especially when we think about completeness and quality of demographic data um, and how we make that data more available and transparent. And that is our 2012 um, FDA Safety and Innovation Act, specifically Section 907. And I won't go into a lot of detail related to this, but I do want to highlight that specifically and um, so, and basically coming from Fidesia, our agency issued an action plan. And this action plan had really three key priority areas with priority one focused on quality, improving the completeness and quality of demographic subgroup data, um, collection reporting and analysis. And I'm gonna highlight guidance documents that our agency has issued in support of that. Priority two being focused on participation and really identifying barriers to subgroup enrollment and developing strategies to encourage greater participation. And there's a lot of work that's been ongoing across our agency to continue to work to advance clinical trial diversity from hosting public meetings, developing tools. And I'm gonna talk about some of the tools that we've developed within the Office of Minority Health and Health Equity. And then finally, priority three focused on transparency and making demographic subgroup data more available and transparent. And this was achieved through drug trial snapshots, which is a program that was developed and is led by the FDA Center for Drug Evaluation and Research. And it provides consumers with information about those that participated in clinical trials that supported FDA approval of new drugs. And I'm gonna present some of the data that we have from drug trial snapshots in just a moment. So guidance documents, one of our first guidance documents where we start to think about um, the collection of data, the quality of the data that's reported to the agency. And this is our 2016 collection of race and ethnicity data and clinical trials guidance document. And this guidance document recommends the use of a standardized approach for collecting and reporting race and ethnicity data and submissions for clinical trials for FDA regulated medical products. Again, I highlighted earlier the categories in the OMB categories for race and ethnicity that we follow. Um, the guidance also recommends, of course, that sponsors and role participants who reflect clinically relevant populations with regards to age, gender, race, and ethnicity. In addition to this guidance in 2017, we issued a guidance focused on evaluation and reporting of age, race, and ethnicity specific data and medical device clinical studies. And then fast forward to most recently in November, 2020, where we start to think about ways that we can continue to advance diversity in clinical trials the agency issued our Enhancing the Diversity of Clinical Trial Populations, Eligibility Criteria, Enrollment Practices, and Trial Designs. And this guidance was really important because it provides the agency current thinking on steps to broaden eligibility criteria in clinical trials through inclusive trial practices, trial designs, and approaches. Um, it also talks about how sponsors can increase enrollment of underrepresented populations in clinical trials and improve trial recruitment so that enrollment in trial better reflect those who are ultimately going to use the product. 
Um, and so that was a really important guidance for our agency to issue as we continue our work in trying to advance diversity in clinical trials and inclusivity of the data that is submitted to the agency. Um, the other area that I wanted to highlight, and I will say first and foremost, I am not a statistician, but one of the other areas that is really important to us is making sure that we are able to continue to advance um, our methods and innovations and in how we analyze the population data. And we have hosted um, meetings in this space. One of the most recent meetings we've hosted in this space that included our statisticians across our agency, as well as experts outside of our agency was held um, in November uh, 2020 and December. And this was a um, really two-day meeting and um, the recording for the meeting can be found on the FDA website. And this was a meeting that was held in collaboration with FDA and the Multi-Regional Clinical Trial Center of Harvard. And it stemmed from some of our stakeholder engagement activities that we have in the space of diversity. And that was with the, of course, Harvard and our CT Center. They had a um, diversity working group that we were a part of. And from that working group, they, of course, issued their MRCT guidance document um, to enhance achieving diversity, equity, inclusion in clinical trials. Um, so this was another important meeting for us because we, of course, want to continue to advance our analysis of that data. So now to shift a little bit and talk about reporting. So we have the information that is submitted to the agency and how do we um, make that data, data more available and transparent. I want to talk a little bit about the Drug Trial Snapshots Program. What's great about Drug Trial Snapshots is that each year the center also puts out a yearly summary report. So not only do we have the data for a particular new product, but we also have the demographic information for um, in the yearly summary reports. This is aggregate reporting. It's based off the products that are approved within that particular year. Um, but it gives us an idea of trends. And I think that's really important, especially as we work to advance diversity in clinical trials and inclusivity in the data that is submitted to our agency. Um, so for example, what we can see for 2017, I'm um, looking at, for example, Black or African Americans, we had about 7% representation, about 11% in 2018, and in 2019, about 9%. You also see that we have the information, for example, um, across Asians, white, Hispanic, we also have age 65 and older, as well as the percent U.S. representation as well. Now, to get into the information from the most recent report that came from our drug trial snapshots program, um, and this was a five-year report, it's really consistent with what we expected to see based off the yearly data, um, but the five-year report was from 2015 to 2019. And um, the information that we have from this is looking at the data just from a global perspective, so collectively from both U.S. Um, as well as rest of world. So when we're looking at that, we have about 35% representation from the U.S. and about 65% representation from rest of world. And when we start to break this down by ethnicity, for example, from a global perspective, collectively altogether, we have about 13% representation Hispanic or Latino. When we break that down even further from a U.S. perspective, we have about 15% representation from Hispanic or Latino, and then from rest of world, about 11%. And then breaking that down even further, as we look at it from a race perspective, um, so from a global perspective for race, we had about 7% representation for Blacks or African Americans. For Asians, we had about 11% representation um, for um, American Indian, Alaska Natives, about 1%, and then other about 5%. And then that can also be broken down further by U.S. versus rest of world. So I'll just highlight, for example, from a U.S. perspective, um, we had about 16% representation for Black or African American, American Indian or Alaska Natives, about 1%, Asian, about 2%, other about 3%, and for white, 78%. And I did want to also talk about this by therapeutic area. So the five-year report has a lot of data. I've only pulled out a snapshot of some of that data. Um, one of the areas that's also important for us to look at is, for example, um, the specific therapeutic areas. And when we look at um, those therapeutic areas by race, we see that the majority of participants within each therapeutic area were white. However, among minority race subgroups, for example, Asians, which um, are represented in red. We, they have the greatest number of participants um, in most therapeutic areas. 
When we look at, for example, African Americans, which are represented in green, we see that the greatest number of um, African American participation is across, for example, infectious diseases, gastroenterology, psychiatry, and ophthalmology. So it, I think this gives us, again, a perspective on data that is um, provided to the agency that's supporting, of course, um, FDA approval of NMEs, and it gives us an idea of the trends from that data. So now I just want to talk a little bit about um, our diversity and in clinical trials initiative, and this has been an ongoing initiative for our office. Um, we developed back in 2015 an ongoing public education and outreach campaign, and really this campaign um, has come from not only um, the 2012 FDA um, uh, Safety and Innovation Act, but also, of course, what we are seeing from um, drug trial snapshots where there's still a lot of work for us to do to continue to advance diverse participation, especially racial and ethnic minority participation in clinical trials. So with this campaign, we've been working to raise awareness through education and multimedia about the importance of racial and ethnic minority participation in clinical trials. And the campaign has a uh, a variety of different tools and resources. We are always adding new tools and resources from videos, public service announcements. We have a dedicated web page, podcast, communications toolkits, um, a range of, of resources within the campaign. And of course, all of these resources, um, we are always working to also establish both collaborations and partnerships. And we have participated in a range of multi-stakeholder working groups, groups to continue to advance these um, efforts. This is just a snapshot from some of the tools and resources that we have available to just highlight, um, of course, across these resources, our goal is to really highlight what a clinical trial is, what it means to participate, and why it's important for us to have diverse participation. We also, of course, have resources available in multiple languages. You see two videos at the bottom right hand of the screen that are available in Spanish. Um, and one of our most recent resources that we developed, um, and this really came from a lot of input from our stakeholders, is to really continue to understand medical device clinical trials, um, what a medical device is and what it means to participate in a medical device clinical trials. And we really work to highlight the importance, of course, within our medical device clinical trials that we have diverse representation. Um, these are just, of course, some of the social uh, media um, outreach that we have to continue to raise awareness and engage, um, to raise awareness about the importance of clinical trial diversity and the importance of diverse participation. And of course, I definitely need to make sure that I highlight that during the COVID-19 pandemic, we have continued to work to raise awareness on the importance of diverse participation in clinical trials. Um, we hosted listening sessions so that we can understand the gaps and needs of the diverse communities. Um, we have COVID-19 guidance documents that specifically strongly recommend enrollment of those most affected by COVID-19, including racial and ethnic minority groups. And we have continued to work to partner and collaborate so that we can um, advance diversity in COVID-19 clinical trials. Some of the resources that I mentioned that we have available are highlighted here. This is not all of our resources from um, our fact sheet, our brochure, as well as our dedicated web page. We also have new tools and resources that we're consistently adding, um, and we also have new resources that will be coming out um, as well focused on clinical trial diversity. And one of the other areas that I just wanted to highlight and, and kind of close out with is the fact that you know, I, I spend some time talking about one specific area of the work that we do within the Office of Minority Health and Health Equity. It's a priority for area for us. We are always working to um, advance diversity in clinical trials. I highlighted some of the data and why it's so important for us, where we advocate for having that specific data specific to race and ethnicity and how we can highlight and share that data from the transparency efforts that is led by our um, Center for Drug Evaluation and Research with drug trial snapshots, how that shows trends. It also highlights areas where we need to continue to do work. Um, but the other area for us that's really important across the work that we do within the Office of Minority Health and Health Equity is providing training for our FDA workforce. Um, we develop a lot of communications for diverse audiences. Um, one, we need to be able to make sure that those communications are able to reach the communities that we serve, but also we need to make sure that those communications that are developed across our agency are developed from a cultural competency perspective. Um, so we developed a communicating with confidence training series for our FDA staff. And two of the trainings that we um, recently hosted were focused on strategies to create effective communications for diverse audiences 
And the other training that we help is focused on the impact of bias on health education and communication. So we are always looking to find ways where not only are we advancing the work for um, our particular office and the work that we do, but also making sure that our FDA staff have the tools, resources, and training so that we can continue to um, advance our communications that um, we develop for diverse audiences. So thank you so much for the opportunity to share information about the work that we're doing to continue to advance uh, diversity in clinical trials, how we report some of that information, as well as some of the other work that we do across the Office of Minority Health and Health Equity. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for your presentation, which again, I'm mindful of the fact that you at the FDA too are also not just looking externally, but also looking internally towards training and things like that. It's been an interesting and important theme that's come up in today's presentations. So thank you for your presentation. Thank you for the important work that you're doing. Um, and now it is my distinct pleasure and privilege to introduce Dr. Emma Ben. Dr. Ben is the Associate Dean for Faculty Wellbeing and Development and an Associate Professor in the Center for Biostatistics and the Department of Health Science and Policy here at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. She also serves as the Director of Data Science Training and Enrichment in the Graduate School of Biomedical Sciences and as a member of the Faculty Diversity Council and the Anti-Racism Task Force. Dr. Ben has collaborated on a variety of health disparities related research projects over the course of her career and has been the founder and driving force behind a number of NIH funded initiatives. Dr. Ben is committed to increasing diversity, inclusion, and equitable advancement in statistics and STEM fields, as well as reducing racial and ethnic disparities in faculty promotion in academic medicine. Dr. Ben's contributions to diversity and inclusion in statistics and STEM have been celebrated by various organizations, including Mathematically Gifted and Black and the American Statistical Association. Dr. Ben, thank you for joining us and we're looking forward to your presentation. Thank you so much for inviting me and I've enjoyed listening to all of the talks. I don't know how much time we will have for uh, Q&A, but um, hopefully uh, we will get that opportunity. Let me share my screen. So I'm going to um, approach this um, conversation from a slightly different angle. Um, as Rachel noted, I, I'm a biostatistician. And of course, uh, statisticians are, are constantly thinking about causality, right? And, and so I, um, I hope that um, my contribution brings kind of a, a, a different angle to this discussion. So when I was asked to give this talk, um, I was told this is the topic, right? How is race utilized, reported, and interpreted in biomedical research? Is the use of race as a variable in clinical research practical or problematic? I think I'm going to get at the, how is it possibly utilized? Maybe how it's interpreted. I'm gonna get at different pieces and, and how researchers can responsibly investigate health disparities, right? I'm going to do my best to tap into to some of these things, but some of the other things might be uh, beyond the scope of my talk. So my primary objective really is to add a causal lens to this conversation by challenging us to move from descriptive statistics to an inferential approach grounded within the potential outcomes framework that informs intervention. So at the end of the day, um, I, I want us to kind of keep in mind that our reason for collecting this information around race, uh, reporting it, um, and, and operationalizing it in research is because ultimately we want to uh, get rid of disparities. We want to be able to intervene, right? And that's, and that's where we want to move. And so sometimes we have to move from a, a descriptive framework to an inferential framework. And I just wanna say that the um, Institute for Health Equity Research um, here at Mount Sinai is really leading the charge around thinking about um, race, um, and, and how it's uh, collected, reported, and operationalized in research. And so I'm, I'm really happy to be able to be a part of that institute. Um, in fact, just recently, uh, the institute has uh, created a disparities consultation service 
for researchers and community partners, specifically around uh, providing consultation with respect to how to um, utilize race appropriately in research. Um, and they've also been a key contributor to the Mount Sinai work group on genomics, race, and ancestral origin um, that is chaired by Dr. Eric Nessler. So just a, a brief overview. So I'm going to try to define what I've called or what others have called a circular slump in racial ethnic disparities research. I'm going to try to give a brief introduction to causal inference, um, and then I'm going to try to briefly talk about how we transition from theory to practice. And so um, if you want to uh, learn more about this, you can always check out my um, commentary published with uh, Keith Goldfeld. Um, and I also teach a, a graduate uh, level course, um, Race and Causal Inference Seminar. Um, so those who are within the Mount Sinai community, uh, you can check it out, but also I'm happy to share my syllabus with those from outside of the community also. So let me just give you a motivating example. A researcher sets out to estimate a measure of the strength of the relationship between race and hypertension, right? She controls adjust for factors uh, associated with both race and hypertension in an effort to get this, what we call unbiased effect of race. This researcher subsequently constructs her statistical model remember I'm a statistician, so we're gonna talk about statistics here, and get some adjusted estimate of the effect of race on hypertension. If you were to ask me what this researcher has learned from the results of her analysis, I'd say not very much, but then you probably ask me why not? And I think that's gonna be kind of the focus of, of my talk. So good research always starts by stating your research question, right? This is what we learn in kind of research 101, right? In our motivating example, perhaps the researcher might have been asking a question about, is there a racial ethnic difference in the risk of hypertension between blacks and whites? Um, I'm not saying that these are the only racial ethnic groups that matter, but I need, I need to simplify it um, a bit. Um, but imagine we could expand this to uh, other groups. We typically state our null and alternative hypotheses. Um, our null hypothesis would be that the risk of disease is in blacks is equivalent to the risk of disease in whites, right? It's our, it's our status quo, it's our hypothesis of no difference, right? And our alternative hypothesis would be that the risk of disease in blacks differs from the risk of disease in whites. We typically power our study to detect a clinically meaningful difference. And for those who, um, I, I know there are a lot of people uh, listening to this talk and I don't want to make any assumption about um, one's uh, statistics foundation. When I talk about power, you can think about, we, we try to get, uh, make sure we have sufficient sample size. We try to make sure we're applying the most appropriate statistical methods. Uh, all of these different things influence power, right? So we, we try to power our study to be able to detect a clinically meaningful difference, maybe we call it delta, some effect size, um, of interest, assuming that that difference exists, given our hypotheses, right? But it's important to understand that if you have a lot of people in your study, you're always going to be able to detect a difference, a statistically significant difference, even if it may not be clinically meaningful. So we sample from the population, we collect our data, and we conduct an appropriate analysis and conclude, for example, we have sufficient evidence to suggest that the risk of disease differs between Blacks and whites with some magnitude at least as big as the effect size for which we powered our study to be able to detect. Do we get any closer to fixing the problem? And I... Um, I kind of went on this journey myself. This was not something that I was taught in, in statistics. This is something that I've learned later in my career, but I needed to turn to some statisticians to help me answer this question, help me understand. So I turned to Kaufman, Jay Kaufman uh, and Cooper, Kaufman being a statistician, and, and Kaufman told me no. Okay, Kaufman didn't exactly tell me no, but Kaufman said no, and this is, this is more than 20 years ago, right? And, and Kaufman and Cooper state, when we set out to measure phenotypic traits in blacks and whites and find them different, we conclude, and this may be unintentionally, that blacks are different, different because they are black. This conclusion reinforces the belief that biology is consistent with the social definition of race, namely distinctions on the basis of skin color, right? They're writing this in 1995. They go on to say, that 
you know, in practice, we observe that population distributions of disease vary on the basis of skin color. But they go on to say that if we pick a physical characteristic other than race at random, like blood type, for example, we would not be able to replicate the same degree of variation in disease occurrence. I'm paraphrasing. Um, they, and, and this is something that, that they said that really, like, I was so happy to see statisticians engaged in this discourse. They say, to believe that skin color has a unique association to outcomes ranging from IQ to blood pressure to prostate cancer by sheer chance is a questionable, if not preposterous proposition. Now, whether you agree with this or not, I don't know, but I agree with it. Um, but I know it's it's kind of a controversial statement, but it was it was so great to see uh, these these status the statistician having such a strong um, contribution to this discourse. And Kaufman and Cooper go on to coin this concept of circularity, right? Where our efforts to understand social factors have the effect of emphasizing racial differences. Like we have to be careful when we're doing this type of research because we could end up further stigmatizing the groups that we intended to help in the first place. And we get stuck in this circular slump that gets us no closer to fixing the problem. Right? We hypothesize their racial differences, we reject the null hypothesis, we conclude that the racial differences is based on something inherent about the biology, genetics, phenotype of race, or we put a statement that says more research is needed to further explain what we're seeing, right? Um, but then maybe you say, okay, this is just the statisticians talking. So I went and tried to find some, some more people talking about this. And I turned to Templeton, who is an evolutionary, is an evolutionary biologist, right? And I'm sure Templeton wasn't reading Kaufman and Cooper's work, but Templeton basically supported their argument. Where Templeton states, humans are an amazingly diverse species, but this diversity is not due to a finite number of subtypes or races. Rather, the vast majority of human genetic diversity reflects local adaptations and most of all, our individual uniqueness. So traditionally, we are taught that it's perfectly fine to evaluate the effect of race as a predictor on some outcome of interest, that, that, that it's perfectly fine to start there. Um, but Another statistician, um, Holland, who was actually uh, thinking about race and causal inference as it related to the educational testing service, um, Holland writes in, in 2003 um, that the race effect that we measure doesn't really have a causal interpretation, right? That causes need to be experiences individuals undergo, not attributes that they possess. Um, and I know there's a lot of debate around this, but Typically, we think of causal variables uh, reflecting the possibility of manipulation. While race is not a causal variable, it can play a crucial role in causal studies for a few reasons. Well, maybe for descriptive reasons. And, and Holland states that, that in his opinion, race can play an important descriptive role in identifying important societal differences such as those in wealth, education, and healthcare. Um, but Howland goes on to say that the attribution of cause to race as the producer of these differences is to him the most casual of causal talk. I, I really like that play on words and does not lead to useful action. But maybe race can be used to understand whether an intervention works differently across racial ethnic groups. That's really, really important. Um, and, and so race, there is kind of operationalized as, as an effect modifier, right? And maybe race is used to, to attempt to delve deeper into the effects of important constructs like discrimination and bias. But ascribing a causal role to race does not get us closer to change. And um, I, I argue um, that in society right now, there, there is a, a big conversation. There's in this era of anti-racism, in this era of Black Lives Matter, where we are, are really trying to think about how, scrutinize how we treat um, racial ethnic groups within minorities, within our society. I think that as scientists, we have to think about how we treat these groups within our research. We need to scrutinize that. 
And so I wanna give you a brief introduction to causal inference. Um, this is a whole field, so talking about it in like two slides is probably not good, but I'm gonna try. The majority of researchers, right, while not always intentional, unfortunately link an association between race and disease with causation, right? And, and like I said, this may not be intentional, but we need to understand something about what we mean by an association, right? An association is only a statistical concept, right? So if we have some exposure and some disease, right, the, the, the statistical relationship will look the same whether the exposure causes the disease or the disease causes exposure. And if the exposure and the disease have the same underlying cause, we will still observe an association between exposure and disease. But causation, now causation is different, right? Causation is not a statistical measure, but stems from a rigorous underlying theory about the relationship between the exposure and the, the, the disease or the outcome, right? Um, and so to test whether um, an exposure causes a disease or outcome, right? And let's assume for simplicity um, that the exposure and the disease are both binary. You either have the exposure or you don't, you either have the disease or you don't, right? Then in theory, right? And I, I wanna take you for a second into this kind of hypothetical universe, right? I'm gonna take you beyond the clouds and, and then I'll bring us back in, okay? But we can conceive in this, this hypothetical world where every individual has a potential outcome in the presence and absence of exposure simultaneously, right? And, and, and in this hypothetical world. And so we could think of the individual causal effect as um, the difference in the outcome, in the presence, the difference between the outcome in the presence and absence of the exposure for a given individual. But I know when we kind of come back to the ground um, that in reality, we can only observe, right? The outcome in the presence of the exposure or the outcome in the absence of the, the exposure in any given moment, right? So we typically make very strong assumptions about the comparability of the exposed and unexposed groups. So, so we, we think of, right? So we move from kind of the individual to, a pop, to populations, and we assume that the unexposed are the counterfactual to the exposed. Now I'm gonna pose a question about race, right? Where I'm going to ask, if we have, uh, if we're looking at race, right? Um, are blacks the counterfactual of whites had the whites been black? And are whites the counterfactual of blacks had the blacks been white, right? Um, we can think of the counterfactual when we think about clinical trials and, and treatments, but with race, the counterfactual is a little confusing to me. I, ha I haven't figured it out yet. Um, but theories behind causation, right, reveal major challenges to understanding what's driving racial disparities in disease outcomes, right? But if our goal is to reduce disease, instead of just describing differences, then we must focus on contextual uh, factors we can plausibly manipulate, like discrimination, like neighborhood pollution, like education, like uh, poor housing or housing. Um, like these are things we can manipulate. We can't manipulate race. And the measures that we are thinking about must accurately reflect the constructs of interest. So a lot of times, for example, we, we, we uh, look at racial differences and then we say we're going to adjust for socioeconomic status and that's going to help us to, to make sure we're comparing apples and apples versus apples and oranges, right? But let's, let's think about this. If we're in a society, and let's say we're adjusting for uh, schooling, years of schooling, but if we're in a society where we know education quality varies depending on where you live and what you have access to, then years of schooling for one person, a 12th grade education means something very, very different than a 12th grade education for somebody who's living in a place where they are not getting 
good quality education. So we have to be careful here because you know sometimes we may um, yield kind of uh, residual confounding. We 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 have some issues there that we have to think about, right? Um, but we also must be able to name relevant constructs and conceptualize or theorize how they operate. Like we need to do the work, right? To think about what actually is the cause that we, we potentially could intervene upon, right? What really is a confounder here? Um, we have to think about all of the possible ways that these things operate, even if we can't measure everything. Um, I know we have the, the director of the NIMHD here, but, um, and I wish we could get infinite resources um, where we could measure everything, right? But at the end of the day, we have to kind of grab the snapshot that we can, can work on, but be really, really think, not get lazy, I should say, about how these things op op um, operate, okay? Um, and I just wanted to say that, um, I think COVID-19, right, um, has yielded increased calls for naming and operationalizing constructs and disparities research, right? Re the, the researchers who were doing this work were doing this work before, but now there's more researchers doing it, right? And I just, you know, every time you kind of go to look for more articles, you find more and more. I can, I can see things where people are starting to name um, you know, neighborhood level disparities, right? Or neighborhood level constructs as areas for, for intervention as it comes to COVID-19 disparities. Or people are thinking about, for example, access and policies we need to work on um, around how we reimburse, um, how we reimburse um, folk in terms of uh, getting access to telehealth and things like that, right? Are we creating barriers, especially now when telehealth is kind of on the rise, right? And we have many others who are talking about racism, right? Um, and talking about kind of all of the structural determinants and the list goes on and on and thinking about occupational exposure. So I think with COVID-19, we are having a discourse here that, and, and more people are at this at this table to have this discourse, and we are trying to um, try to identify mutable targets for intervention. And I think we can learn a lot from the work that's being done um, around COVID nineteen. So, in summary, if we are to move from describing racial differences to identifying mutable targets for intervention, then race cannot be our endpoint. Now, it may be our starting point, but it, it cannot be our endpoint. And we need to ground our approach whenever possible within a causal framework. We have a lot of conceptual models, but if we try to operationalize where those things fit, it's very difficult to try to figure out where we could potentially intervene. It's a difficult paradigm shift, but baby steps can go a long way. I'm hopeful. All right, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Ben, for your fantastic talk. Thank you to all of our speakers for their fantastic presentations. And um, now we're going to get started with the Q&A portion of our program. Um, many thanks to those of you who have submitted questions for our speakers. And I'll turn it over to Kevin Weiss and Paolo Smangstab, our student moderators. Uh, thank you so much to all of our uh, distinguished speakers for their really informative uh, talks. And I just wanted to take a moment to thank all the members of the Levy Library, um, including Galley, Carrie, Rachel, Angeline, for all of their work behind the scenes to really put this together, uh, this event together. Um, and I guess, you know, we received a lot of questions to just turn it over to the Q&A. We've received a lot of questions from um, a lot of um, individuals. And I think, you know, one of the main uh, questions is how can we interpret previous work and find values in their conclusions and um, even the policy implications that have occurred due to them and build on that foundation. Um, and this is really couched with you know, the background, um, just knowing that, that we have a lot of studies um, that have limitations such as the small sample sizes, um, lumping together these different racial and ethnic categories and changing norms. Um, but I guess I, you know, maybe we can turn this over to Dr. Uh, Perez Stable first, and maybe you can uh, speak towards this. 
there. So what's the question? Is is how can we interpret these previous past data? Yeah. Yeah, past data and find out. Well, that's a great question for especially uh, uh, more um, uh, regional studies and even for macro studies. Um, the reality is that uh, we've done it differently throughout our history. If you go back to 1890 or to 1790, the census has done variations in a variety of ways. Um, the modern history starts with 1980 when they came up with Hispanic. Um, and it was a critical uh, change in part because it is the largest uh, racial ethnic minority group in the U.S. right now and growing and continuing to grow. Um, we've been pretty good about uh, self-identified white, self-identified African-American. Um, and, uh, and so I think data going back to 1980 has on um, mortality is pretty solid. Um, and uh, I think uh, not only is, uh, you know, national uh, mortality is the ultimate outcome and we can see changes over time. Um, linking it to economic data also is helpful here. So I, I do think that this is very valuable to compare. Whether you can fully compare across clinical systems where people weren't measuring it or where people were using different terminology uh, is, an, is a good question. And I, I don't, you know, we can go on and on, but I'm sure you want to ask other questions or have other people respond. Great, thank you. Um, Kevin, did you have a question? I'll turn it over to you. Sure. So I think I think you all talked a lot about the work that has been done both inside and outside of your organizations today. And just with the understanding that we have attendees representing a really wide range of different affiliations and levels of society, of research, of academia. Um, and there's a lot of interest in what people who are on this call can do. So I'm curious if you all can uh, provide some thoughts about what some actionable changes that attendees here in the institutions that they're affiliated with can implement to improve collection, improve reporting of race and ethnicity data? Well, my, my, my only first and only plea right now is that you ask. You, you don't know what you don't know, right? So I think the first problem has been that people don't ask. And there's now a increasing, there's some, some scientists who are saying, well, we should completely take it out of our, our context. Um, I think um, uh, Emma, Dr. Ben's uh, uh, analysis and perspective is absolutely correct. You know, we're not talking about causation here. Race doesn't cause these things. Uh, but there is a factor that uh, we see these, you know, dramatic differences. We're not talking about a subtle P of 0.05. We're talking, you know, with differences of three or four or five years of life expectancy, that's huge for a population. So understanding why that is and getting to the cause of it is really what this is about. Uh, and similarly, there are, you know, um, I showed you data that uh, African-Americans actually complete suicide at a much, at a one third the rate of whites. That's one of the outcomes that, that African-Americans do better along with Latinos. And so understanding why that is, 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 in my view, the, the main reason to measure it. And then to have a standardized way of doing it. If I want to say, ask one way, and you want to ask another way because you don't like the term that I use, and, and someone else does it another way, then what are we comparing? Um, and I think that um, uh, we, we're getting a lot closer to using uh, standardized terminology with alternate names so everyone can be, feel okay about the name being used. And, uh, and so I think, again, since... About 1980, it's been reasonable. I've been since 2000, it's been, I think, uh, better. It's still not, you know, as well as well as it could be. So, terrific. Uh, did anybody else want to speak towards that? I'll leave the floor open. Um, I I think uh, that the the previous comment <laughs> probably captured almost everything, but I, I do think that, yes, I, I should say that, yes, I I'm, race is not causal, right? Um, but I, I do think that it is sometimes hard um, for researchers to make that transition from race to racism to, you know, these structural determinants. It's very hard to make that transition. Um, and I think also, you know, for 
example, it's, it's hard to think about how, or we have to think about too, how do we kind of push that forward, that shift, but also are we getting to a point where we really, like I said before, are further stigmatizing groups, right? Everyone is thinking about the fact that Blacks are doing worse. Blacks are doing worse on various things, right? Um, but but a lot of people haven't been given the tools or been a part of the discourse in terms of thinking about why that is um, and, and what type of interventions we can um, pursue. And so, I, I like I said, I think that it's important and also uh, the talk uh, from the FDA perspective and in terms of um, underrepresentation of, of racial ethnic groups from, from a causal perspective, we can think about how underrepresentation of racial ethnic groups um, in, in trials um, can bias, yield bias population average treatment effects. So what we see in that trial may not actually, <laughs> the effect we see in that trial may not actually uh, play out <laughs> in the target population that includes so many people that we excluded from the trial in the first place. So I, I think that just having this discourse is, is really important um, and, and thinking about strategic um, strategy or strategies to kind of uh, intervene is important. Yeah. And I'll just, what Dr. Ben and, and LSAO ha have mentioned, I mean, I think from, from that FDA perspective, if we're thinking about you know, diversity and inclusion, one of the areas that we talk about all the time is that we have to continue to um, really work to engage communities, think about those strategies and best practices so that we can advance inclusion and help to answer the questions that we've talked about here today. If we don't have representation in the trials, we're not able to adequately answer those questions. We're not able to communicate the information to the public. So, you know, we really work to try to find out what are the strategies where we can be most successful, communicate that, um, so that we can start to see and have the data um, so that we can make informed decisions. Yeah, and I think, you know, one thing that struck me from uh, Dr. Benz at the end of the talk is, is just talking about the resources that it would take to look at these, you know, um, variables that we can manipulate. And I think, uh, you know, even uh, Shri touched on this with her um, the commentary about funding Black scientists. And I think even in that paper, you know, black scientists do work on these problems and they want to investigate it. So I guess it's just, you know, what are the resources that it takes to really tackle some of these problems and really get to at the root cause of some of these issues? Uh, I, go, ahead. go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> I was going to um, add, you know, there, there's some questions coming in the Q&A. Uh, I, I totally think that we need to stratify these uh, analyses whenever possible not adjust um, as the first knee jerk, but if you look at, uh, you know, one of the areas that has the least amount of research, I think is what about middle-class African-Americans and Latinos? There's just no, there's very little published research or data uh, out there on it because people have always assumed they're all poor or they're, you know, and so, and so we, we know less about that group and the little that there is, you know, also raises some issues. So stratification initially uh, is the better strategy than just to adjust. And I think in the introduction, someone mentioned about uh, race only being a U.S. or primarily being a U.S. Um, issue. Uh, and I think that historically that's been true. It's in our constitution. Uh, you know, we were founded on, on slavery uh, as a principle of our society, despite the, um, the great uh, thing of democracy. Um, and in France, you know, it's illegal, actually, illegal to ask about one's race and ethnicity. Yet um, what we've seen in the last 30, 40 years is that uh, the UK and the France and, other, and Germany and other countries have now experienced immigrants from other countries, whether it be North Africa, Africa, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, um, or the, the former uh, English colonies. Uh, and they do have diversity by race, ethnicity. And the British have started to look at data related to uh, Blacks and South Asians and seeing differences uh, as well. So this is a global issue that is going to be coming more relevant uh, if we continue the, on the path of, uh, you know, uh, uh, of global integration of more people moving around, around the world. Uh, we were able to ask about race ethnicity to uh, uh, adolescents in Northern Argentina, where 70% of the 
of the population as either indigenous or mixed indigenous. They, the kids had no trouble identifying themselves as one of three groups. Um, and, uh, and, and this is at a time when that was never done uh, in, in, uh, in Latin America, so. Yeah, I think that practical point that you brought up uh, is something that we encountered very soon because after every paper is uh, published in Cell, we, we do reach out, uh, especially for this Faces of Cell initiative. And it's been very US centric for this reason where uh, some of the PIs have said, I'm not sure if I'm allowed to ask this in this country where I am, or what do these groups really represent? Or we've had authors come back and say, I don't know. Do I belong? So again, uh, I think you know it, this is this is not to detract from the conversation here. But again, as we are thinking about um, underrepresentation, disparities, differences, um, those kinds of more absolute seeming. I, I realize these are not absolute; these are evolving. But more absolute seeming categories, um, uh, you know, that's that's one way. But how else? How else can we encourage more of at least uh, you know these voices or these um, uh, you know, individuals to, to, you know, give them more of a platform, you know, as we're thinking beyond the US as well. I mean, that's something we encounter editorially. And I think just to that earlier point in terms of um, uh, just the kinds of studies and, and, and looking at the impact, you know, I think there, there's obviously disparity in funding and what kind of things get funded, right? Very fundamental, very basic science. And when it comes to, um, uh, 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 black, other minority researchers, many of their research is more applied in a sense, more relevant, uh, socio, uh, socio-economic in a sense. Uh, just as an editor, I find it quite surprising because a lot of this basic research is built, you know, there is this pitch of what's the eventual translational relevance. And yet when you've got this kind of actual real life relevance to these kinds of, uh, you know, human subjects, uh, help, actual applied aspects, I feel, I, I find it quite surprising that there is this huge disparity in funding. So I think until you get some more resources, even at the funding level to be able to ask some of um, these questions, you know, um, gene environment interactions, um, you know, as you said, social uh, mobility, uh, middle class African Americans, you know, all of those things, it's just a lot more resources and a lot more funding with this recognition that we can't get anywhere without those kinds of resources. And, and it, it has to start with, with, with more of um, the allocation of research resources and, 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 and interest. So more people even devote time to that question too. Yeah, I wanted to say, um, Dr. Narasimhan and, and Paulos, like, uh, back to this idea of resources. I think it's, I think we can't, we cannot have this conversation <laughs> about this research that needs to be done without acknowledging um, the important um, papers that have been published by Hop and, and, and colleagues and, and others who um, talking about how difficult it is for, for African-Americans to get funded um, and, and for disparities related researchers to get funded. And I think that, you know, at the end of the day, if I think about it from kind of the, the academic medical infrastructure, those who are doing this work are constantly, um, constantly struggling with trying to make sure that they will have their jobs, right? That they can pay their staff that they can write. And, and so we do need to value this work. And I agree um, with what Dr. Narasimhan said that, you know, th there's so much bias there about whether or not this research is, is important, whether positioning race and disparities kind of in one's research agenda is important. Um, and, and so I think that this needs to be discussed more because you're absolutely right. If we do not have the resources to do this work, we are not able to help the communities that we are trying to, um, that we are trying to serve and, and, and improve their health and well being. And it's just, it's like an elephant in the room. Um, I think if, if we don't have that conversation for those of us who have to rely on those, those funding on funding to do the research that we are doing within kind of the standard kind of academic infrastructure. Well, I think that for
for the sake of time, we're probably going to have to leave it there. Although I know we received so many interesting questions and um, you all are having a really interesting discussion. So I'm sorry to cut things short, um, but um, I do want to thank all of you so very much. I want to thank each of our speakers today for their fantastic um, presentations and really valuable perspectives. I also want to thank um, the event team, um, Paulos, Kevin, the Levy Library team, and of course, Mount Sinai Media Services. And I want to let everybody know, I want to thank all of you. I want to thank all of you for your time and your attention this afternoon. I want to let you know that um, a recording of this presentation will be available on the Levy Library YouTube channel. And I want to invite all of you to um, connect with us and follow us on social media and stay up to date uh, with future events. Thank you so very much, everyone.